The clavipectoral fascial plane block is a relatively new technique that's made for one purpose, to anesthetize the clavicle. It's a cool trick to pull out of your bag when dealing with clavicle fracture, and in this video, we'll go over the anatomy, sonoanatomy, and technique for clavipectoral fascial plane block. The clavicle is the most commonly broken bone. Ouch! And while most can be managed without surgery, we do see a decent number coming through for fracture repair. The innervation of the clavicle is, surprisingly, not entirely clear. Even today, there is some disagreement about which nerves supply this bone. Here's what we know for sure. The superior surface is supplied by the intermediate and medial branches of the supraclavicular nerve, part of the cervical plexus. The underside is served by the subclavian nerve and the lateral pectoral nerve. As for the rest, depending on the source you read, there may be some contribution from the long thoracic nerve, the spinal accessory nerve, and or the suprascapular nerve. Here's what we can say. Since the clavicle appears to be innervated by a combination of cervical plexus and nerves originating from C5 and C6, a really effective block combination for clavicle fracture is cervical plexus block and interscalene, particularly because the cervical plexus block will numb the skin overlying the clavicle, where the incision is for fracture repair. Now that combination is great, but there are some scenarios where using these two blocks is less than ideal. The first is when you really want to avoid a phrenic nerve block, like in someone with bad restrictive lung disease, where taking out the hemidiaphragm might be hazardous. The interscaling brachial plexus block is likely to take out the phrenic nerve, and depending on the technique and volume of local, the cervical plexus block can too. Bad news. The other scenario is when there's a question of neurologic integrity, and you don't want your block confusing the issue after surgery. Fractured clavicles have been known to impinge on the brachial plexus, and a post-op deficit can be hard to sort out if the arm is still all numb. Similarly, clavicle fractures often occur in the setting of other upper limb injuries. If the surgeon wants to evaluate radial nerve function after a mid-shaft humeral fracture plating, it's best not to do a pre-op block. Here's where the clavipectoral fascia plane block comes in handy. The clavipectoral fascia is a band of fascia that envelops several structures on the anterior chest, including the clavicle. Think of it as a tubular sausage casing around the clavicle. The nerves that innervate the periosteum of the clavicle, whatever they may be, pierce the clavipectoral fascia in order to get to the bone, and therein lies the opportunity to block. Here's a sagittal view of the chest, with the clavipectoral fascia enveloping the pec minor muscle and then splitting to surround both the subclavius muscle and the clavicle before continuing on into the neck as the prevertebral fascia. The block technique involves advancing a needle from the caudal aspect to slip inside the fascia, filling up the potential space within and thereby blocking the nerves and nerve endings supplying the bone. Because we're not targeting the brachial plexus, this is a motor sparing technique and patients can use their arm right away after surgery. To do this, we'll have the patient supine in a linear probe positioned over the clavicle in the sagittal orientation. The needle is advanced in plane from the chest side. Gently scanning the clavicle, it's possible to precisely locate the fracture site and therefore know where to go on either side. Here we see the disruption of the bone cortex and a jump off. Here's the clavicle with the needle approaching from the caudal aspect. We can't really see the fascia overlying the clavicle, so our goal is just to scrape the periosteum and lift the fascia up. Our first injection looks extra fascial. We advance to 12 o'clock and our next injection shows the fascia lifting off the bone and the clavicle being depressed. We can see it spilling down the cephalad side, which is a good sign. We'll stay here and deliver our whole bolus. Because the fracture is likely to interrupt the integrity of the fascia, it's a good idea to perform this block on both sides of the fracture. We'll put 10 to 15 mils of 0.2% repivacaine at each site. If we're after quick onset and surgical anesthesia, consider increasing the concentration to 0.375 or 0.5. Clearly, if the fracture is near one end, the double injection may be tricky and you may have to settle for one injection. The clavipectoral fascial plane block is not designed to get skin coverage since the local is sequestered within the tubular fascia. However, we've noticed that sometimes we do end up getting the skin overlying the clavicle and upper chest wall, i.e. the supraclavicular nerves. It may be that some local escapes the sheath due to the fracture or needle puncture, or perhaps some of the skin fibers traverse that fascial compartment. In any case, to be complete, it's quite easy to do a supplemental subcutaneous injection just above the clavicle in order to numb that area. Easy for the surgeon to infiltrate the skin too. Alternatively, a supplemental cervical plexus block has been shown to be a good combo technique as well. In fact, compared to our default plan of interscaling plus cervical plexus, the clavipectoral plus cervical plexus spares the diaphragm completely, not so with interscaling. Interestingly, in this study, pain scores after surgery were zero in both groups, highlighting not just the safety but the efficacy of this technique. 
In fact, it's been used for a weight clavicle fracture repair, bilateral in this case, and you can see the degree of surgical incisional trauma to each side. Great job. Here are some clavipectoral tips. We're used to using blunt tip block needles for many blocks, but these can glance off the fascia and clavicle and take some negotiating to get into the right place. There are no nerves here to worry about injury with, so using a sharper needle, like a 22 gauge spinal needle, is sometimes useful. Second, if the clavipectoral fascia has been disturbed in the past, it may be scarred down and this block may not work so well. Consider this if your patient is undergoing revision clavicle surgery or if the fracture is quite old. A different technique may be a better choice. And finally, it makes sense to perform the cervical plexus block first. That'll anesthetize the skin and part of the clavicle and make the procedure a comfortable one for the patient.